Welcome back everyone. Now whether you've been doing this hobby since before the dawn of the internet or if you just started recently there's one thing that we all have in common and that is that at some point our circuit is not going to work the way that we expect it to and we have to fix it and the process of going through and finding those errors and fixing them is called debugging and today I'm going to be talking about some effective debugging techniques when trying to take a circuit that doesn't work the right way and get it working correctly we can just blindly poke around we can just go through and reflow every solder joint but those can be very time consuming and it can be a very frustrating experience so today I'm going to be discussing what happens when you have no signal and what happens when the signal isn't what you want and so stick around and we're gonna walk right through that before we actually started on debugging, we're going to discuss the things that you need to help make this as efficient as possible. While it is possible to just kind of fumble around and eventually get something to work, there are a couple of basic tools that we're going to need for effective debugging. The first is going to be a multimeter. I've got here a couple of different multimeters. I've got this old one has been with me for, I don't know, 15 years and has done a lot of good work. It's just an inexpensive one from Harbor Freight. And this is my newer one that I've had for a couple of years and it has worked really well for me. Um, but even just a basic one will work. The main functions that you need though is the ability to measure DC voltages and the ability to measure resistance. Measuring capacitance is also helpful um, and also having a continuity tester is really helpful. And what do I mean by a continuity tester? Continuity tester will simply tell you when you have continuity between two points. This is really handy when you're in the midst of debugging and you're trying to figure out if one trace connects to another or if one wire connects to another and you don't want to or can't look up at the display to see what the resistance rating is. You just listen for the beep when you connect your two points. Now, the next thing that you're going to need is an audio probe. And an audio probe can be really super basic. For example, here's a really old one that I've had for a long time. And this is just a jack, a quarter inch jack, that has a capacitor soldered onto the tip connection and then I have this um, alligator clip that I use for the ground connection. And what you would do is you would clip this guy onto ground and you would go probing around with the other end of this capacitor which blocks DC and you'd go probing through your circuit to um, listen for the signal. I've got another one that I made that helps make things sometimes a little simpler because while this one just attaches to a guitar cable that you already have, I had an old and expensive $5 um, guitar cable where one end started going bad. The, the, soldering, the, the solder connection to the other jack wasn't very good. So I just cut it off and I soldered in my capacitor onto the signal line and then on the shield line I soldered on a, uh, an alligator clip here. And so this end just plugs directly into an amp or to um, my audio interface so that I can listen as I'm probing through the signal. And if you don't know what that means, we'll get to it. Now, I also have a test box here. This is my own design. Uh, this is my super awesome test box 2000, which actually was only ever meant to be kind of a temporary, very tongue in cheek name, but it ended up being representing kind of my goofy sense of humor pretty well. And what this does is this test box allows us to have our inputs and outputs over here. We can bypass the circuit. We can use an internal tone generator to generate a test tone that we control with this level. And this test tone will actually get injected into the circuit so that um, you're not having to like constantly strum the guitar to have a, a signal to listen for while you're audio probing. And then the probe switch here makes it so that instead of taking the, um, the circuit output, it actually is going to take the probe output. This is a multimeter probe that is connected here. 
and um, all, all it does is when I touch it to the circuit board, it takes the signal from wherever I touch it and sends it out of my output jack. And then I've also got connections for my nine volt and ground. I've got connections for my send and return on both the left and right side. And then I've also got controls down here. I've got an onboard headphone amplifier and a stereo mono switch so that I can um, listen to the headphone out, either send the left signal to both sides, which is mono, or send the left to left and the right to right. The nice thing about this box is that it makes everything fully contained so that when I have a test circuit over here that I want to be looking at, um, I don't have to have any other external connections. I don't have to have anything on in or out. I can just turn on the tone and I can plug my headphones into the headphone out and I can monitor through the headphones while I'm injecting the tone and I can turn on probe and I can go trace my way through the circuit. So this box is really super handy. Um, I occasionally have um, populated PCBs or kits available for these, sometimes even fully assembled ones if you're interested, but there are other test boxes out there that, on the internet that have plans for them. And um, they do a very similar job, just not all of them have all of the same features. Um, other things that can help would be, for example, an oscilloscope, or if you're working with digital, having a logic analyzer is really handy. Um, you're also obviously going to need a, uh, an amplifier or I typically use the sound card on my computer, the audio interface on my computer, because um, I don't have an amp really close to my bench, but I have my computer right next to it. And um, I mentioned an oscilloscope. I don't have an oscilloscope, but what I do have is this little board here. This is made by Espotech. It's called the Labrador. And this is just a little board that functions as a basic oscilloscope, logic analyzer, multimeter, um, and power supply. This, I think this cost me 30 or $40. And you don't get super high bandwidth or super high resolution, but this has come in super handy on a lot of my projects. I use this whenever I have an LFO that I'm uh, using. I use the oscilloscope function to see the shape of the LFO. Um, so there are other devices like this that you can get that are much higher end. Um, Digilent makes the analog discovery module and I believe um, analog devices makes something similar also, but they're a big step up in price. You're looking at, um, I think the analog devices one is about $200 and the Digilent is 400 or something like that. So significantly more expensive. This little guy though, for pedals has done everything I've needed it to so far. Now that we've talked about the equipment, there are a couple of other things that we really have to have in order to make our debugging session successful. And those are a copy of our schematic, which I've actually got on two different pages here, and a copy of our layout. I blew this up huge so that it would be really easy for me to be able to look at the um, look at the printout and figure out where everything is going so that I can correlate this between my circuit board and my schematic. Um, the reason you need these is because as we're going through the circuit, you're going to want to be able to reference what the circuit is intended to be and what you're actually getting from the circuit. So I actually am just going to keep these over here off to the side. Make sure you've got yourself a pen or a pencil so that you can write because we're going to be writing on these printouts. I find it helpful to print them out so you can write on them and make notes or you know check off places that you've already looked, things like that. Now the first thing that we're going to be talking about is um, when you have no signal. I have here my little test circuit board that I've got that I'm going to be using today. This was the revision 1.0 of what became Aeronomatron. And this board actually had a couple of very tricky things going on with it. 
that um, I had to hunt through. You'll notice that I've got an IC missing here and my switches and pots are missing. That's because I've set it to maximum depth, maximum shape, and the voice control is essentially set to zero. And I'm using the default behavior for the, um, for the control and the LFO shape. Everything else though is here in place. And so um, when we're starting out with a circuit that has no signal, the very first thing that we want to do is check our DC voltages. Um, but we don't want to just go in and blindly probe around everywhere with our multimeter because there are a lot of places in the schematic where we'll find voltages that really are not all that important. Put my multimeter up here. So it, when we are first looking at a case of having no signal, the, the voltages we want to check first are the DC input jack and then the power pins for any integrated circuits that we might have. We'll want to check the transistor pins and the transistor bias. We'll want to make sure that any voltage regulators that we have are producing the correct voltages. And also if we have any kind of reference voltage, we want to make sure that we're looking at that. If we come over here and reference my schematic real quick, in the power section, you will see that, whoop, there goes my pen. This right here is our input pad to our nine volts. And then we have a VB or V bias right here. That's our reference voltage. So we'll want to make sure we check that point. And then we have a voltage regulator here that has five volts coming on the output side of it. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my board. In this case, when checking the voltages, you don't even need an input signal. So for right now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to connect my ground, make sure that's the right thing, yep, ground and nine volts. And then let me see if I can get my multimeter here in the picture. I set it to my DC voltage. And for ground, I'm just gonna find any old open ground connection that I've got. Uh, keep my hand out of the way there. So there's ground. And if we connect over to here, we see that we've got a little over nine volts. So that's great. Now, I also have a voltage regulator over here. So let's just look at this. We have got nine volts there. And we have got nothing there, which is ground. And we have got five volts there. So our five volt regulation is working. So now let's check the power pins of our ICs. This guy here is a dual op amp, so the power pin is going to be pin number eight over here. And that's looking great. And then on these quad op amps over here, the power pin is going to be pin number four. That's got our nine volts. And that's got our nine volts, awesome. And then uh, this is a microcontroller, so he needs are five volts. So I'm gonna probe pin eight, which is his power pin. And we see we've got our five volts there. Very good. This is a quad CMOS switch and the power pins on this guy are going to be pin 14 and ground will be on pin number seven. So we'll check power to this guy. And that's nine volts as well. So we have the correct voltages going to our DC input jack and to our power pins. I don't have any transistors on here to check. The voltage regulators look good, but I do have a bias voltage. So this bias voltage is produced between the junction of R24 and R23. And so if I come and I take this guy, R24 and R23 are right here. And the junction between them is this guy. So I'm going to go and probe that junction. 
and that is 4.99 volts. So that's our reference voltage. That's good as well. So power looks like it's all in order here. So more than likely the issue is going to be something with the signal path. So I'll go ahead and move my multimeter out of the way here real quick. And I am going to need to hook up my input and output to the signal so that we can actually put that in there like that. Yep. Okay, so those are now connected. So what I'm going to need to do now is I am going to connect my output from my test box here. And that's going to allow me to um, test what we've got coming through our signal here. Now, if this circuit were like in a box or something, I might actually test everything to make sure that signal is getting from the input jack to the switch correctly and from the switch to the board. But because I'm working with just the board, I don't have to worry about that so much. So um, we're going to turn the circuit on and we're going to have our test tone there. Okay, so now what we can do is we can begin to probe the circuit. And what we want to do is we want to start from the beginning and just kind of trace our way through until we find a problem. So here is our circuit. Move that guy out of the way. And let's take a look at this real quick before we start digging in with probing everything in sight. Here is our input. And as we come in, we have our pull down resistor, we have our input cap, we have our uh, resistor for biasing the op amp since this is a non-inverting gain stage. And you can see that just by connecting minus around to the output, that means this is a unity gain buffer. But then what happens on the output of this buffer is we split the signal into three parts. It comes through R3 into this section up here. Right here. It comes through R4 into this section all down here. And then there's also this path that comes down like this and around and right up into our output buffer, which is also set up as a summing amplifier. You can see by the configuration of having all of these same value resistors going into the negative input of the op amp with a resistor in the feedback path and our reference voltage on the positive, this is a summing amplifier configuration. So the way this circuit works is that we take our dry signal that comes up through here and we sum it with this filter stage and this filter stage. For the purposes of our debugging, I have set this voice control to zero. So this whole section down here is not going to come into play right now because even when I turn this down to zero, I'm still not getting what I want, which means that there is an issue with something either up here or out here that is making it so I'm getting no signal. So what we're going to do is we'll start with the input and we'll go along probing different points in this circuit. Okay. Okay, we're back after a quick little delay. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to start probing the audio path all the way through our uh, circuit. So what we're going to do is keep our circuit over here along with our layout. I'm going to turn on my test tone and I'm going to turn on my probe. And the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to probe here at the input to my circuit just to make sure that the, sig the signal that we want is there. And so that's the sound of my test tone. It's just a very simple um, 
kind of squarish wave that uh, I actually have a, a little trimmer potentiometer inside of here where I can tune the frequency. I keep it somewhere in the kind of low E range. So we can hear that we have signal right there, which means that it's coming in on our input. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to probe on the other side of C1, which also happens to be our pin of our um, op amp. Now, you'll have to forgive me because this schematic has actually already been corrected for the mistakes that I made. So the pin numbers in a couple of places don't necessarily match up, but in this case, it still does. So here we go, pin five. We're not getting anything out of there. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we're not getting anything there, but we're getting signal there, which means that between our input point and this pin on the op amp, we have an issue, which means that our problem is going to be C1 here. Now, if I flip this board over real quick and we take a close look at where C1 is, you'll notice that I've actually got a solder joint here where I didn't get nearly enough solder on that pin. So what ended up happening is that um, there's not actually an electrical connection that's being made there. So I'm gonna fix that and I'm going to remove power from the board so that my soldering iron doesn't mess with my power supply and do something weird. And I'm just gonna come in here and I'm gonna give myself just a little bit of solder. Okay. And now we'll flip the board back over. We're gonna hook our power back up and we will go back and we'll probe again. Slippery alligator clip. Okay, so we're just gonna do a sanity check. There's our signal there. And then we come over to our pin here. Ah, there's our signal. Awesome. So now, if we uh, turn off our tone generator and our probe, well, let's go ahead and turn on our tone. You can hear now that I'm getting signal all the way through because I'm monitoring this output. However, as you listen to this output, you'll notice that there's no effect going on. It's just the clean signal. So I'm actually going to turn that off so that I don't offend your ears any further. And I'm actually going to plug in a guitar so that we can listen to the quality of the signal. Because while the, the tone generator is really useful for telling whether or not signal is present. So we've got that going on. There's our nice clean guitar signal, but it's not supposed to be nice clean guitar signal right now. Right now it is supposed to be affected signal. So. What I'm going to do now is start looking into what the issue could be. So the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going, so I know that I need to be looking in this region here. Where did I put my pen so that I can, there's my pen. So I know, scoot everything over so that we can have a better view here. So our problem is going to be somewhere in this block, okay? So what we'll do first is we'll audio probe here um, at the input side of R3. When we start probing our off amps though, there are a few places where we're not going to audio probe just because we don't expect there to be any signal. VREF, we don't expect there to be any signal on VREF, okay? So I'm not gonna bother looking there, so I'm going to probe here at the negative input of, a, um, of an op amp, sometimes you'll have uh, an audio signal present there and sometimes you won't just because of the principle of operation of an op amp. If you're not familiar with how an op amp works, I suggest you go um, study up on it a little bit. I have put a link to um, what I feel are a couple of really good articles on basic inverting and non-inverting op amp stages and they're really, really helpful for understanding what we would expect things to be like in our audio path. Because just because these are in our audio path does not mean we'll have audio audible signal everywhere in here. So let's go ahead and turn on our tone again and our probe. And we're going to go poking around at R3, which is going to be, okay, 
Okay. So we've got signal going on there. Now we want to check that's also the same as pin 7. So we can sanity check with pin 7 over here. So there's that signal. We're going to see if we have anything coming out of this next op amp stage. And that's going to be pin 8. Uh, something seems a little weird there. Okay? Because we're not hearing much. So if we were to go and now go to the minus input of this next op amp that's at pin 13 and we only hear kind of this weird low hum so what we're actually going to do is we're going to come back and check some voltages okay because you'll notice that we have v ref here and we have v ref here so bring my multimeter back over here and we are going to check our voltages. I'll leave that down for you to see it a little better. We're going to check our voltages at pins 12 and pins 3 of my quad op amp here. So we'll ground. Pin 3 is not VREF. And pin 13 is also not VREF. There's something weird going on there. But if I come and I probe pin 2, well, there's my VREF right there. And if I come and I probe pin 14, I've got that. And if I probe pin 12, oh, there is my VREF. So I'm going to write this on my schematic real quick. Um, so let's see. What did I say? I said that uh, I had plus 4.5, ooh, that's really messy, plus 4.5 volts, but I had that down here. I also had plus 4.5 volts. I believe that was, I've got to recheck this. Sometimes I have to check over and over just to make sure I'm not crazy. So we've got VREF there, not there, and not there. So this is 14, 13, 12. So we've got we've got that there. So what it looks like is we have our VREF all flip-flopped on us compared to what it needs to be in our schematic. We needed to have the reference voltage on the plus input to bias the um, op amp properly, but I, these, these connections here got flip-flopped, okay? And in fact, um, I think these might have been flip-flopped on the board as well, but we'll go ahead and we'll give that a try and see what happens with our effect. And what I just so happened to have here beside me is the op amp that I used when uh, this issue came up. So I'm going to unplug this and I'm going to use my fun little dental pick here to help me pry this package out of here. It's a chip. Quick little pointer if you're laying out your own uh, CDBs, I don't recommend sticking capacitors right up next to both ends <laughs> of your socket. It can make it hard to get those out if you ever need to get them out. Okay, so there we go. I finally got that thing back in, and now listen to that. That is exactly what we wanted to hear. So it turns out that what the problem was, was that I actually had my reference voltages flip-flopped between the terminals that they needed to be on um, with my op amps. And what that did was that made it so that the configuration was all wrong because you can't just flip-flop the terminals because each terminal has a specific purpose. So once I did my really ugly work around here with soldering some wires and flip-flopping them in the, in the um, socket there, which by the way, I highly recommend sockets whenever working with integrated circuits like that, it's now working exactly as I intended. 
So there we go. We've got this nice sweepy filtery goodness, which is what this pedal is supposed to do. It's what it did on the breadboard, and now it's doing it on my circuit board. So what I ended up having to do was actually spin another circuit, uh, another revision of this circuit board that actually had those things corrected. And on the subsequent one, I'm happy to report that not only did I get these uh, reference voltage connections correct, but I actually managed to solder all of my components correctly so that I had good solid solder joints. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and leave a comment. I'm also commonly on the various Facebook groups and forums. And hopefully you can use these steps to begin to find the problems more easily in your builds. Some of you may already have tons of experience with this and it's old hat. Others of you, you might be hearing this for the first time. So good luck with your circuits and happy building.